the whole point of these extension hot topics is that how everything works um, with Purdue Extension is that there are educators in every uh, county in Indiana. So I think 92 is the correct number. Um, and in each county, the Ag and Natural Resources educator, we educators, we cover a lot of different backgrounds. Uh, for instance, my background is in turf. Um, but in area eight, we've got uh, Krista who does animal science. We've got Courtney who does insurance. Not everyone can be an expert of everything. So when we can't figure out what's going on um, as extension educators in your county, we get to fall back on the state specialists. Um, part of that is uh, the plant, uh, excuse me, the uh, um, plant and pest diagnostic laboratory. These are the guys um, on campus. They've got the lab equipment. They've got the uh, knowledge. Um, we approach them quite a bit uh, with some of those things that we're not sure what's going on with. Um, so they're a great resource. Um, I'm not going to say too much because I don't want to take away from Tom's presentation. Uh, but the whole purpose of this uh, webinar is that we want exposure to what Extension has, to the expertise that uh, backs these programs, um, and just make sure that you guys know that you know it is a network of people that uh, work together to get you the best information possible. So with that, it is 12.02. Tom, I'm going to end this poll and then mute myself, and the floor is yours. Uh, we do may ask that everyone uh, remain muted. There are a number of people here, uh, so we don't want to have any, too many noise uh, disruptions. If you do have questions, uh, we just ask that you direct those to the chat box, and then one of our moderators will take care of that. Uh, so with that, I think that's my last announcement. So all, all yours, Tom. Okay, uh, glad to be here today. Um, joining me uh, today on also online in this group is John Bonkowski, the other plant disease diagnostician here at the Plant Diagnostic Lab. And uh, he may be helping monitor the chat or may jump in with some comments here and there with some things. Um, the Plant and Pest Diagnostic Lab has been operating at Purdue for uh, over 30 years. And um, the, the main goal of the lab is to provide a resource for identifying plant problems and identifying insect problems on plants. Uh, we also handle all sorts of other problems, and sometimes we end up being kind of a referral service to other specialists on campus. And uh, the, um, the things that we handle range from field crops to lawns to trees to turf to um, fruits, vegetables, and everything in between. And we also even handle problems like household insect identification for when uh, an exterminator, for instance, can't identify the insect that they're finding. So it's a very wide ranging service. And it's also wide ranging in that we get a lot of help from other people on campus. It's not just me and John here doing everything. We also get help from specialists in agronomy and horticulture and other people in our plant pathology department here, as well as horticulture, forestry. So uh, we try to connect people to uh, a wide range of services and expertise here on campus. So I wanted to talk a little bit about our diagnostic process. This is sort of a philosophical process that we, we break down diagnosis into these steps uh, and trying to help you understand how it works in the diagnostic lab. And we have six steps here recognize what's normal, look at the symptoms and signs that are present, uh, look for patterns of occurrence in the uh, sample or in the field, ask a lot of questions, and then we get to what happens here in the lab with diagnostic lab tests, either making isolations on uh, isolation media or doing uh, serological tests or PCR tests. And then we get to the final diagnosis part. So what I wanted to talk about here is that um, give you some examples of what we have to look for in this process and why some of these diagnoses can be difficult to arrive at and what the, the roadblocks are to diagnosis. First of all, it's to know what's normal for the plant. Um, if you um, look at uh, these three trees here, 
you might think that uh, the tree on the right is going down and dying and uh, it, it's uh, something severe has happened to it. But what really is the issue here is that you've got three different trees here. The first one is spruce and it's normal for that tree to be evergreen all winter long. But on the other hand, we have two other conifers that grow in the area called larch and ball cypress, and they normally lose their foliage in the winter. So this is perfectly normal coloration for larch in the fall and for ball cypress in the winter. So knowing what's normal for those trees is important. Uh, one of the seconds, uh, one of the steps here is to look at patterns. And uh, we know from experience that things which occur in a random pattern are more likely to be related to a biotic cause. In other words, something that's infectious caused by a pathogen or possibly a, uh, an insect. And uh, things that are more completely uniform are more likely to be abiotic or otherwise caused by a non-infectious cause, something like weather or cultural problems. Uh, on the left, you've got an uh, aerial view of what uh, oak wilt occurrence looks like in the forest, where you've got scattered uh, red oak trees dying from an oak, oak wilt infestation. And on the right, you've got boxwood transplants there that are dying because of transplant stress. These plants are simply not watered properly after they were put in and died from transplant stress. So on the left is a random pattern, on the right it's a uniform pattern. We ask a lot of questions of you when you send a sample in. We want to know when this problem first showed up. What is your main concern? We may be looking at something else uh, other than what you're mostly concerned about. If fertilizers or pesticides have been used, we'd like to know what those were and when they were applied. Uh, what kind of pattern of damage are you seeing? And to ask for help with that, we may want you to send in photographs of the situation, especially with trees and turf. It's very important to have photos of those uh, situations. Uh, what plants or varieties are affected? Uh, sometimes a particular problem is more severe on one variety of plant versus another. Or if you're seeing the same symptom across 10 different kinds of plants that might point to uh, a non-living cause like drought stress or maybe even herbicide injury. Uh, what kind of environmental conditions have you observed? If it's a tree, how old is that tree? How long has it been in the site? Of course, the more information you give us, the better the diagnosis will be. So what are some of the more difficult problems to diagnose and what are the roadblocks to getting that diagnosis? and uh, getting an accurate diagnosis out to you. Well, one roadblock is that, especially for trees and shrubs, symptoms that appear up in the top of the tree can be caused by problems or further down in the tree, uh, either on main branches lower in the tree or in the main trunk, uh, maybe at the soil line or maybe even the root system. So we have to consider all of those possibilities when we're looking for what problems might be showing up. Um, a roadblock here might be that uh, the tree roots may be causing the problem. This is a, a photograph of a tree that has what we call a girdling root or a stem girdling root. That's uh, one of the major roots around this tree started growing tight up against around the trunk and it's actually cutting off the water supply to that tree. And uh, you wouldn't know that without excavating the area to look for that kind of problem. So when uh, trees are planted from a container or from a ball and burlap, they may have this kind of uh, root system start to develop. And uh, it's very important to watch for this. And if you've got a stunted tree, uh, this may be one of the situations. Well, the real roadblock here is getting down in there to look for that. Uh, the best way to look for that is using a, as a professional arborist, using an air spade to blow the soil away with high pressure uh, air 
to uh, be able to look down in the root system to see what's there. And that's a fairly expensive process and not many arborists actually have that equipment. So not knowing what's below the soil is a real roadblock there. So this is a, a girdling root. And these can actually be treated by cutting away those roots uh, and allowing the tree to recover. Um, then another roadblock is that the same symptom on a tree can be caused by several different kinds of problems. And so trees and uh, plants in general only have so many ways that they can react to uh, a stress or a disease problem. And one of the ways that shows up most commonly with trees is that the edge of the leaf will start to turn brown and necrotic. We call that symptom leaf scorch. And here we've got four different possible causes for that same type of symptom. So uh, it's a real difficulty in trying to sort that out. So another roadblock here is it may just be sort of a process of elimination, trying to figure out what's causing that. This is a, uh, an abiotic stress. It's not caused by a disease or an insect problem. And uh, the way that we determine that is further questioning the, the person and finally getting photograph in of the tree showing this generalized decline and learning that this was mainly due to uh, a kind of a drought stress situation in that area plus soil compaction around the roots of that tree was leading to decline here. Another possible cause for this is bacterial leaf scorch. This is a, one of the few bacterial diseases that we have on trees, but it's caused by a bacterium in the genus Xylella. And it's spread by leafhopper insects from tree to tree, where they feed on one tree and then go and feed on another tree nearby and spread the bacterium that way. This is a slow rolling decline of trees. It may take years for a tree like this to go into decline, but it's something that will show up in the heat of the summer every year. And it may only be on a few branches initially, but it may spread later on to the rest of the tree and lead to a general decline. And we, the only way that we can identify this is with a PCR test. And another roadblock there is that it costs us uh, $50 to perform that test. So it's an additional fee. Our normal lab fee for in-state samples is only $11, which is, uh, the lowest in the region and one of the lowest in the country. But we do have to add an additional fee for this kind of PCR testing to confirm these more difficult to identify disease problems. Another problem that we have, uh, another disease problem that can cause similar symptoms is oak wilt. This is a fungus, uh, Brittiella fagaciarum. And it's spread by insects attracted to wounds in trees, but it can also be spread from tree to tree if you have uh, two uh, trees of the same type nearby. This is a problem only on oaks, and it's mainly a problem on the red oaks, uh, red oaks and black oaks and uh, pin oaks. Uh, and it would be a rapid decline on a red oak, but a slower decline on white oaks and bur oaks. And the symptoms look similar to the other ones that we were talking about here. Um, but the other distinguishing feature here is that uh, when you've um, got um, a, um, this kind of uh, discoloration showing up here in the sap wood, when you cut into a branch that's affected by oak wilt, you'll find this kind of discoloration on the stem. Uh, where it turns the vascular sim symptom uh, uh, system dark. And another feature is that leaves will drop very rapidly in the middle of the summer from a, an infected red oak as it goes down. But the, the, the real thing there is getting the right sample to us. We've got to have this kind of branch. And sometimes that's difficult to get a branch because the first branches may be high up in a tree. And uh, to make a, do a good isolation of this, we need to have the sample sent with an ice pack in the sample and have it sent overnight to us 
to have that sample arrive in good condition. And then again, this is uh, confirmed with the PCR test. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is uh, not the easiest thing in the world to confirm, but if you get us the right sample, get it to us in good condition, we can usually get a confirmation to you using that uh, molecular or PCR test. Uh, the fourth one in that group is burr oak blight, which is caused by a fungus called tabachia. We uh, confirmed that in the lab by doing isolations. This is only a problem on burr oak, and that's generally up in the uh, Chicago land area and on into Illinois is where we see this developing. Uh, but, but that would be uh, uh, needed to be confirmed by isolation and molecular sequencing. Another problem that you may run into is verticillium wilt. Now, verticillium has a much broader host range than oak wilt. We see it mainly on maples, but there are 10 or 15 other trees where it can commonly occur. And the trouble with verticillium wilt is that it's a soil-borne organism. So if you have verticillium in the soil, and it can be a problem on potatoes and some other field crops, but if you uh, go in and build a house where there's verticillium in the soil, then plant a maple tree. When those roots come in contact with the maple, then it can infect the root system. Uh, or when the roots come in contact with the resting structures of that fungus in the soil, the roots can be infected and then it grows up the root system and then starts killing branches as the water conducting vessels get pl plugged by the fungus. And you see again this kind of dark discoloration and streaks in the uh, in the vascular tissue, like shown here with this red bud. And if you make a lateral cut, you'll see this kind of streaking in the wood, and you'll eventually see dieback. So we have to have this kind of sample with a streaking showing, or we can't confirm this for you. We have to do an isolation. And it takes uh, sometimes up to three weeks, two weeks for the uh, fungus to grow out to allow us to uh, uh, confirm that for you. So the real roadblock here is uh, needing the right kind of sample and sending us photos of the site will help as well. Uh, we sometimes run into samples where it's really a yellowing problem like shown on the right here. Our technical term for this is called chlorosis, but stunting and yellowing on uh, river birch, maple, and several other trees in a good part of Indiana is very often related to a nutritional problem. And it's not that there's a lack of nutrition in the soil, it's that the soil pH is too high. And uh, this is really a symptom caused by either iron or manganese deficiency. And when soil pH goes up, those two elements become less available to the trees to take up. They're in a form that's not as mobile, so the trees can't take it up. But when, if you can get the soil pH back down, then the trees can start to take up those uh, elements and the deficiency symptoms disappear. So, the roadblock there is you have to do some t testing to find out. You may need to send a soil test to a commercial lab for uh, uh, soil testing to find out what the pH is and what the uh, nutrient levels are. You may even need to do a, a test of the leaves uh, during the summer to find out uh, what's happening there and compare those two tests. So it requires some time and expense. And uh, we can help you with interpretation of those results. Uh, we can't do the testing here at the lab for that, but we can uh, help with the interpretation of results if you do get testing done. And um, so that's a bit of a roadblock there. Um, here's a problem that I really want to make everyone aware of. Uh, it's called boxwood blight. If you haven't heard of that, uh, you probably will eventually if you have boxwoods in your landscape planting or if you're working with clients that do. Uh, this fungus is Calinectria pseudonaviculata. We've known about this in Europe for many years, uh, but 
It was first found in the U.S. in 2011 uh, at the same, uh, within a couple of months of each other, both in Connecticut and in North Carolina. And this is a very serious problem of boxwood. It's the most serious uh, boxwood problem we have because it causes complete defoliation of boxwoods and will kill them within a couple of years of, of uh, infestation if uh, something isn't done. Uh, it has now spread to at least 25 states and counting and in three Canadian provinces. Uh, it's found in, both in landscape and in the retail uh, nursery uh, trade. And um, it's, it's a very serious problem for us. The symptoms show up first as uh, leaf spots uh, with black borders like this. And then later on, you'll see black streaks on stems that are still otherwise green. Now, uh, a common problem that we have on boxwood is all called vitella blight that we've had forever on boxwood. And it can sometimes look like this. So this is not a guarantee that it's uh, boxwood blight, but it's something to trigger concern if you see this. And these sort of elongated black stem cankers is what we're seeing on a boxwood. And then rapid defoliation starting at the bottom of the plant and working the way its way up from the inside out and then from the bottom of the plant up is an, another indicator of this. So um, you have to compare this to Vallutella blight. Uh, with Vallutella, it's usually just one or two branches and the leaves say, usually stay attached to the plant. Uh, with Vallutella, the bottom of the leaf is usually sort of a, a salmon color spore on the bottom, but with boxwood blight, it's more of a white color underneath. And then the leaf here on the right has both on the same leaf. And then we would, uh, this is a closer view of the uh, boxwood blight. So this spreads locally by wind or wind-driven rain or uh, contaminated leaves blowing around, maybe even people or animals carrying it because the spores are kind of sticky and could get, uh, get onto tools or clothing, movement of debris. But long distance spread is by infected plants in, uh, from nurseries in the plant trade. So the IDNR, the regulatory body for Indiana, does a survey every year looking at all boxwoods that grow or sell nursery, uh, sell boxwood, all nurseries that grow or sell boxwood. So they inspect uh, between 100,000 and 200,000 boxwoods every year at about 63 locations in 28 counties. And in 2018, we did have an introduction of infected plants into some big box stores. And the IDNR stopped sale and destroyed those plants. And we were able to confirm that for them. But we, we do have boxwood in the landscape in a couple of locations in the state. So the real roadblock here is getting the right sample at the right time and getting the pack, right packaging. So. We need several branches showing a range of the symptoms. We need some of the needle leaves that are turning brown, maybe including some of the recently fallen leaves. And you need to double bag that to make sure that nothing escapes. And then clean everything up after taking your sample. And another roadblock here is that it can look kind of like Vallutella blight. So now I'm going to shift gears and uh, that we'll, we'll stop talking about boxwood blight, which is one of our invasive things that is new to the Indiana. Uh, 2017 and 2018 is when we first found that. And we're going to be moving on to something we've had for a long time.
excuse me, I got a little choked up there. Hey, Tom, uh, just real quick, <clears throat> while we're kind of in a transition, uh, there was a question, um, anything that we can grow in zone five to replace boxwood with similar characteristics, is that something you recommend uh, when people have issues is um, alternative vegetation to provide uh, the same sort of characteristics? Um, there's really not much that looks just like boxwood. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, There, I'll jump in here. There is a list of um, plants that can be used in place of boxwood. It's not gonna look the same. It's not gonna perform the same, um, but I don't have it on hand. I was actually looking in our, our simple information to try and see if I could find it. Um, but there is a list that has actually been curated by Ken Cody, one of the IDNR inspectors, and that also uh, Janet Beckerman has in some of her slides when she discusses boxwood blight. I'll have to go find it and uh, maybe provide it at another time. And that's something too. Uh, we'll do some researching when uh, you when everyone gets the follow up email from um, Courtney Schmidt. Uh, we'll try to get that resource in there as well. <clears throat> I apologize for the um, coughing. It's a common problem with me. Uh, I want to talk about a couple of uh, soil-borne organisms here. Uh, one is Phytophthora, which loosely translates into English as the plant destroyer, and it's well-named. Um, what you need to know about this is it acts like a, I mean, it looks like a fungus, but it's not, not a fungus. It's related though. I mean, um, it, we, we treat it like a fungus, but it's a water mold because it loves moisture. And there are several different species of this and it, it has a wide host range, but the different species attack different kinds of plants. And it can be very difficult to manage once it gets into the soil or if it gets into a nursery and gets into their irrigation system. Where we run into it in the landscape is usually a root rot problem but it can also cause a bleeding trunk canker and a, a foliar blight at times. So the problem here is uh, finding the pathogen because we have to make isolations for this using a selective media. We have a rapid dipstick test that's kind of like a rapid COVID test that we can use on plant material, but we have to have the right sample from you if you're going to send in problems for this. So let's take a look at the kinds of material that we need. This is American beech. And if you look here at the base of the tree, you've got this black discoloration running along here. And this is all uh, where, uh, where the, um, um, the tree has been infected with Phytophthora that splashed up from the soil onto the trunk and then infected in those areas. And if you look a little bit closer over here, you can see the, the areas where it's really black here. It's showing a lot of, it's beginning to decay the trunk. And this is gonna be a slow uh, decline. This is a problem on American beach, especially. We also see it on a maple and some other thin bark trees. But the kind of sample that we would need would be chips of bark from this area right here. And it may only just be a little uh, one inch or two inch square chip of bark and it doesn't need to be very deep, but that's what would be required to be able to confirm this. So, you know, not people don't really want to send it cut into their tree bark, but in this case, when you've got that kind of decay going on, a small sample of the bark there is really not gonna harm the tree any further. So this is what I was just saying there, you know, it's a little bit scary to cut into the bark, but it's, if it's shallow, then we can try to do an isolation or a rapid test for that. So here's another problem with boxwood. This is looking at the top of the plant, it's going down. Are you gonna know what's going on here? Well, sometimes you have to dig down and look further. Uh, the same thing can occur with you. 
Um, this is a problem with uh, a U hedge that's been tightly clipped. And the site here is very wet because they've let the downspout empty into this uh, planting bed. And what's really happening there is that there's root rot in the case of the U and then root and on up into the crown of the plant and the base of the trunk of the boxwood here. And that kind of decay right there is uh, what's being caused by the phytopter. So we would really need the entire plant or at least a big chunk of the root system with either one of these to, uh, to identify it. And we need to preserve those smallest roots when you're sending in a sample because the very small roots, the tiny feeder roots, are the ones that we really need to look at to make isolations. So when you're sampling for Phytophthora root rot, be sure you dig the plants up and then shake away some of the soil to make it lighter. Uh, but don't, don't just pull the plants up or you'll lose a lot of those roots. Here's an example of Phytophthora causing an aerial blight. Uh, this is our annual vinca plant, uh, where sometime in, when it gets hot, like in July and August, the particular species that causes this, Phytophthora, uh, starts to show up or it gets splashed up from the soil. And um, if you plant vinca in the same bed year after year, you're gonna get the same problem year after year. So getting it diagnosed is important to know how to avoid it. A similar problem is caused by a related organism called Pythium. It's also in the soil and it has a very wide host range and uh, it can be a very serious problem killing things like annuals or it can simply attack the roots of plants and cause kind of a stunting or, you know, the plants may look generally wilted or yellowing a little bit. Uh, here's where uh, a hanging basket of petunia that has uh, a couple of plants going down and a couple of others that are still living. And if you get into the root system, wash away some of the soil, you'll see this kind of uh, symptom where you've got the tip of the root is uh, rotted away and you get what left behind is what's called a rat tail. Now that's not symptomatic specifically of pythium, it's like anything that causes the roots to rot will do that on a plant, but we often see that as kind of a telltale sign telling us to look for pythium. So with both pythium and phytophthora, the real key to management here is to start out with good drainage. No matter what else you do, if you don't have good drainage, if you've got pythium and phytophthora in the soil, then you're going to run into problems with that because they love water. Uh, the other thing you can do uh, in the way of cultural management is to avoid overwatering. And then if you've got plants that you know are going down, you can go ahead and remove those infected plants uh, wherever that's possible. And avoiding over fertilization can also help. Whatever you can do to minimize plant stress like judicious watering, uh, only when needed, uh, anything to reduce stress will help. In the landscape, we really don't recommend fungicides very often unless you're working with a, an area that's in a very highly visible location or a high value bed uh, of plants you really feel like you have to save. And there again, only if the drainage is good. Um, if you spray, spray a uh, Roundup on your grass and you see the grass die in a week or two, then you, you know what caused it. That's not a problem to uh, figure out. You know, that's a, a no brainer. However, if you're out spraying weeds near your roses and you get a little bit too close to a rose and you're doing this in August or September, the rose may not show any symptom at all until the following year. And then it may show the kind of symptoms we're looking at over here with what we call a sort of a witch's broom effect with uh, the stunting and strap-like foliage showing up here. 
Now, Roundup is not the only thing that can cause that. That could be caused by a virus, but um, that kind of uh, leaf distortion is, is uh, something that we have seen with overspray of glyphosate in past years. So uh, here's uh, another thing to be, uh, look out for, where if you get too close to a thin bark tree, like maple, it can contribute to bark cracking, which looks similar to Southwest injury or winter sun scald on uh, maples, young trees. This would only apply to young trees, but the symptoms may show up months later. So the roadblock there is that we don't have a chemical test for herbicide exposure, especially months after it happened like that. So trying to diagnose that is really going to depend on getting accurate information on what herbicides were applied, when, what rates were used, you know, did you use a shielded sprayer to do that? And, uh, and you know, realizing the symptoms may be months after the application. So some of these things are not easy to figure out. Uh, another category of plant pathogens we work with all the time are viruses. Now, only, I think less than 5% of our plant samples involve a virus, but we do a lot of virus testing uh, because when it does show up, it uh, can be difficult to sort out. Uh, viruses cause what we call models and mosaics. Um, I would call this symptom on the rose here more of a model, but uh, mosaics are more of an angular pattern uh, you've got ring spots showing up here on this cherry with Prunus necrotic ring spot virus. I don't know why I keep jumping ahead here too fast or jumping back. Sorry about that. Uh, but stunting, distortion can all occur with that. Um, here's a bleeding heart plant with tobacco rattle virus on it. And then here's a, a rose with rose rosette virus. Well, the roadblock here is that Virus testing uh, requires specific tests to do, and you have to know which virus you're looking for before you can do that test. So, for example, if we're looking for some of the really common viruses, it may only cost us about $10 a virus to do the test, and that's the cost to us. But for some of the more uh, uh, viruses that are we don't have an easy rapid test for, it can cost you know, $25, $50 to do that test, and we have to pass those costs on to you. So we have to consider what's the value of the plant? What's the importance of the situation? Is this something that's going to spread in a commercial situation? Or is it uh, just one plant in the landscape that's affected? So we have to make those decisions about uh, how much testing to do. So that's a, the real roadblock there is the, the expense involved with virus testing. <clears throat> Moving on to lawns, uh, if you're trying to do a sample of a lawn to get to us, then uh, we've got a couple of different ways that we get these in commonly. From golf courses, we get these uh, cup cutter plugs, like you see on the right. But if you're working in a home lawn situation, um, what we want you to send to us is something about the size and shape of a shoebox. And the easiest and best way to do this is to take your super heavy duty aluminum foil and double it or triple it, lay it out on the turf where you're taking the sample and then cut a plug about the shape and size of the shoebox, put it in the foil and then crimp it up the sides of the sample. Then you can just put that inside another plastic bag, put it in a shoebox and it's not gonna shift around too much in transit it'll be about the right size that we need for uh, analysis. And the other thing is that you need to show part living and part dead tissue with the turf. The sample needs to be taken from the active edge of where it's dying. The other thing with turf is that we really require photos of the site. So for instance, these two examples here, what are you noticing here? 
Well, those straight lines on the left there were not caused by a disease problem. The fungi don't have rulers. They don't follow a pattern like that on the lawn. And they also don't follow a sharp demarcation of a line there. Uh, so what we're seeing here is that uh, the problem on the left is a fertilizer application overlap, while on the right, you've got a disease, but the photograph would help us to determine what to look for because this is ryegrass in the foreground that's being wiped out by gray leaf spot. But in the background, you've got bent grass, which is not susceptible to gray leaf spot. So those two photos tell us a world of information about what's going on. So when you've got a turf problem, send us a photograph. It may be something like this turf not doing well here under the trees. Well, turf tends not to do well there. And this looks like it may be a poorly drained area. But there's a lot of shade there. There's some moss growing. It would be better to simply put mulch in that area instead of trying to grow turf. When you're taking photographs that are close-ups, include some kind of object there that shows the relative size of what you're looking at. Then when you're collecting samples from uh, small shrubs or uh, perennials or annuals, take a look at the whole picture. And if you can, send us the whole plant. But if not, then sample from different parts of the plant and uh, try to include a sample of the roots in the soil as well. If it's something that's maybe hitting at the main trunk line, it may require a sample from the whole plant. If you're looking at root rot, like I said before, dig up the plant instead of pulling it up because the roots like this are the ones we're going to be looking at most. Uh, when you're shipping things in, be sure to package it well. If you've got a whole plant, wrap the base of the plant with uh, plastic and secure it at the main stem with a twist tie, then you can wrap newspaper around it and cover the rest of it with plastic. Be sure your form is outside the wrapping so that it stays dry and then ship it to us by mailing early in the week, not over the weekend because it'll degrade over the weekend. When you're sending us photos, you can upload them at our website. Uh, you can send up to nine uh, high quality images there. And very often we can help you identify problems that we couldn't otherwise work with. Photos of trees will give us the uh, picture of what's going on here, uh, like these row of uh, uh, white, white pine showing here. Uh, you may be able to show us something up in the top of the tree that you could not otherwise sample. Uh, this site situation will tell us that this is probably white pine decline or transplant stress. Whereas uh, up in the top of the tree on this spruce, this may be white pine weevil attacking at the top of the tree. It can show us the extent of the problem on a tree, like the uh, verticillium wilt shown on the left here on red bud, or there's a uh, canker here shown on sycamore on the right. And all of those can be very useful in diagnosis. With some insect problems, if it's a large enough insect, we may be able to tell you what it is just from the photo. Like the picture on the left clearly shows that this is calico scale. And on the right, this very distinctive damage is caused by cicada egg laying injury. And so you never know what's going to turn up when you send in good photos. This is our team. Uh, Todd Abramson is at the front desk and helps us with a lot of other things in the lab as well. Uh, when you call our main number, you'll reach Todd. He, he can answer a lot of questions related to what kind of samples to send in or billing or anything like that. John Bonkowski is the other diagnostician here. And uh, we are, uh, uh, get help from people in horticulture like Kyle Daniel. Um, and if it's a turf problem, we'll be calling on Aaron Patton if we think it's a, a non-disease problem in, uh, in the horticulture department, or Lee Miller, our new turf pathologist here in the botany and plant pathology department. 
Uh, Janet Beckerman helps us out with fungicide recommendations on ornamentals. She's also uh, very knowledgeable about diseases on ornamentals and fruits, uh, working mainly with apple trees. And uh, one of her newsletters is listed there, Facts for Fancy Fruits. If it's an insect, uh, we need information about where it's found, the degree of infestation. Uh, you can send insects in in a vial of rubbing alcohol, or you can send it in on the plant tissue if it's a small insect on a plant. But we get help from entomology like Cliff Sadoff and uh, Laura there. Uh, herbicide injury problems and weed ID problems. We call mainly on Marcelo Zimmer, but we also get help from Bill Johnson, both of whom are in the botany and plant pathology department. And uh, this is our phone number here. And uh, this email address goes to all three of us at the lab, ppdl-samples at purdue.edu. If you're driving in, uh, bring a sample to us. We have a dedicated parking a spot just off of Russell Drive. We're behind Lily Hall. And uh, just inside those double doors is our uh, lab. And you can fill out a form online. There's a downloadable form. Again, fees are $11 for Indiana, 22 for out of state, plus any virus or other special testing that may need to be done. I wanna take an opportunity to encourage you to take a look at the Purdue Landscape Report. The URL for it is right here. Or you can just Google Purdue Landscape Report and get right to it. Uh, it comes out twice a month during the growing season, a very good uh, resource. But I also want you to take a look at this link to the Purdue Plant Doctor or Google that, purdueplantdoctor.com. There's a wealth of information on trees, shrubs, and flowers here, as well as beneficial insects. And, um, uh, you can get a lot of good information on many, many different problems there. This is the same information that was contained in the Purdue Plant Doctor uh, cell phone apps that we that uh, Jana Beckerman and Cliff Sadoff developed, but now it's available in a mobile-friendly website, so it's uh, free and easy to use. So with that, I will stop and we can try to answer questions. Thanks, Tom. Um, <clears throat> John's been doing a great job in the chat room uh, with the different questions that have come up, uh, whether it be the boxwoods or mailing in um, different issues. Uh, I guess one question I had is, when are you the most busy uh, working in extension? Uh, right now, we're pretty, um, pretty slow in terms of samples, but when do you see the most uh, samples coming into your office? And uh, is that something that, you know, as a state, we could kind of say, hey, this month seems to be kind of heavy, or these are the conditions we see that for the most part, uh, we're gonna have some of these situations where a sample might be worth sending into you guys. Yeah, well, we start to get busy right about now. Uh, it's when we start to ramp up. We had only two or three samples a week uh, up until this week, and we've gotten about 20 or so this week already. So uh, it's becoming quite busy. Most of our samples right now, of course, are from greenhouse samples. These are the plants that the, the nurseries and greenhouses are growing to get ready for you for the spring season. And uh, we're helping identify problems there. We get really the busiest is in June and July. and um, for many years, it was really kind of like a bell curve peaking in June, but uh, of late over the last few years, we've had um, uh, that sample load spread out a little bit more and we've stayed busy on through August. Um, so it's, it's getting a little harder to predict, but we're getting, uh, we're, we get maybe 20, 30 samples a day in June and July. So we're hopping <laughs> quite a bit and we have a lot of long hours in, in the summer. We would like to try to put out some kind of tool that says, here's what we're finding in the lab this week. But it revol really involves going back and looking at the last 15 years of data just for that week. So it's a little bit difficult to, uh, 
sort that out. So we're, we're working on that kind of uh, website tool for you, but it's going to take a while to get it going. And then, um, <clears throat> Tom, would it be OK if uh, these slides would be made available uh, to these uh, individuals who are on the um, call today? Sure, sure, that'd be fine. Excellent. I didn't mean to put you on the spot there, um, but uh, that was something that folks were asking because there was a lot of good information.